Hey, good evening. Oh, nobody's even paying attention. Good evening. Heck, welcome to lunch. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> welcome to People's University. It's been a long week. Um, I do ask that everybody silence your cell phones now. Um, sadly, next week is the last class of this series. That's Thursday, January 20th at 7 p.m. Dr. Hale, who's with us tonight, will be teaching that class as well. That's Class 8 epilogue, duck and cover, is the Cold War over? Uh, uneasy partners in the first Gulf War, the momentary seduction of democratic peace theory, structural conflict between big powers and the legacies of NATO and Russia, Cold War armaments, nukes, biological warfare, control of resources and powers of display are just some of the things that we may be discussing in that. So, um, you know, if you're interested in any of that, come to our last class. Uh, this People's University, I think has been absolutely fascinating, one of the best in our, my opinion. So a big thank you to Sean for putting this together for us. Um, as fascinating as this has been, it's also been very terrifying in some respects. And our next People's University promises to be the same, both fascinating and terrifying, though in a very uh, different and whimsical way. So People's University Fairy Tales for Grown Ups, there are brochures on everybody's table here. That start, series starts Thursday, February 17th. Um, we're going to get into the gruesome origins and often very violent uh, versions of some of the, our most beloved children's fairy tales uh, that started out not for children. We'll be covering a variety of fairy tales from Italian, which you think Rapunzel, Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, German, we've got Grimm's Tales. Those are things like Rumpelstiltskin, The Pied Piper, Snow White. Uh, my part of the world, Scandinavian, that's the Little Mermaid, Ugly Duckling, Snow Queen. We'll also be doing covering Celtic fairy tales, Appalachian fairy tales, and we'll end with Ancient Greece um, in a puppetry finale class featuring Aesop's fables as interpreted by the WVU School of Theater and Dance. That will be March 24th. It's a six-week series. Each class will feature a local storyteller as well as an expert in each genre of fairy tale. We'll have hot chocolate, a campfire, and more special surprises that you'll have to come to see. And um, I, I have to repeat this. This is not for children. There's a reason the title is called Fairy Tales for Grownups. So that's our next People's <laughs> University. It starts Thursday, February 7th. Uh, next Monday, we're closed for Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And then the following day on Tuesday, weather pending, um, at Lunch with Books, Tuesday, January 18th at noon, John Mueller, uh, I'm sorry, John Muller, author and co-founder of Lost History Associates in Washington, D.C., will be here to tell us about the sojourns of Frederick Douglass in Wheeling, which is part of a larger portfolio of more than half a dozen visits he made across West Virginia in the mid to late 1800s. Uh, he actually made several trips to Wheeling, and we'll hear more about that if the weather holds up. Um, John is driving from Washington, D.C. in what may be our biggest snowstorm of the year, or maybe not. So. Uh, we will we will know by Sunday whether or not we're going to go uh, forward with that program on Tuesday. That's January the 18th at noon. Okay. Tonight's instructor, Dr. Corky Hale, is associate professor of history at Zanesville campus of Ohio University. She began she began her career examining the nature of Irish neutrality policy during World War II and after, as well as European diplomacy in the immediate world post World War II era. More recently, her research has expanded to include use of historical, oh, I'm sorry, included, I skipped a line there, modern popular culture studies. She's currently working on a monograph exploring the historical methods in science fiction. Um, Dr. Hamilton earned a BA in journalism and history from the University of Montana, a master's of science in international history from the London School of Economics, and her PhD from the, in history from Ohio University. Please walk me. I am so tongue-tied tonight. Please welcome Dr. Hale. And the good news, you being tongue-tied is going to make me look good. All right, so the first thing I want to say is please forgive the fact that I'm pretty hoarse. It's the first week of classes at Ohio University Zanesville, so I've been speaking nonstop for four days after not having to speak for about six weeks. So I'll be sucking this down like nobody's business. 
Um, thank you um, to, to, the, to the library for inviting me this. I didn't know People's University existed. And after they invited me, I looked into all of the previous classes. You guys are so lucky. This is so cool. I want to suggest this to my local library, but they look a little stressed and overstretched these days. So I'm not sure I want to add something to their plate. And I recognize that if I suggest that the first thing they're going to do is suggest that I offer it. So I want to be a little careful there as well. Um, it is also, I got to say, wonderful to be able to talk about the Cold War to an audience who actually remembers the Cold War. <laughs> I teach all the freshman classes at Ohio University Zanesville, and my students, I kid you not, these days were born after 9-11. The brand new freshmen, I have some high school students well as well, so the brand new freshmen, 2004, they were born, 2005-ish, and they, they don't know what the Cold War is. Um, maybe they've heard about the Cold War from their parents. Increasingly, it's their grandparents. And as someone who remembers the Cold War pretty, pretty well, that's, I try not to think about that too much. You know, it's, it's one of those things you don't realize as you get older, you, you don't think, wait, this was just yesterday, wasn't it? And then I'm talking about it to students for whom it never existed at all. Um, and since, since occasionally they ask me something like, Professor Hale, what were you doing on 9-11? Because they're saying, I was in kindergarten. It's like, I was teaching history at Ohio University Zanesville. Um, I've been doing this for a while, kids. It's, it's a little straight, um, st startling somewhat. We're at the very end of the Cold War, which means the next thing we need to bear in mind, which I know you guys have been studying at um for several weeks now. Um, it's important for all of us who remember the Cold War that the history and historians aren't done with it yet, right? I mean, this is true for the entire Cold War. Um, there are still metaphorical fistfights among historians over who started the Cold War, over whose fault it is. At every single moment, was the Marshall Plan a good thing? Was the Marshall Plan a bad thing? It's, it's insane. It's still all being worked out. Every year, we get more historians involved. We get more distance. We get more, more consensus out of it. But that's for the origins of the Cold War. We're at the very end. We don't have all the documents yet. We, we don't know what the Cold War is going to mean for future generations. Um, there's an old joke I'm sure you guys have heard. Um, somebody asked Zhou Enlai, uh, Chinese foreign premier, about um, what he thought of the French Revolution. And his answer was, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> we're, we're kind of in a similar place for the Cold War, right? It's too soon to know about the Cold War. Um, it's true throughout the Cold War. It's never more true than it's, um, than it's ending. By the way, if you're wondering why I've got notes in front of me, I promised my students I would say something about this. Um, it's, it's because if I don't have an outline, I wander off into the underbrush and I don't always come back. <laughs> my students know this, they like this. Sometimes they use it to their advantage and talk about cats. <laughs> they know what works, um, but, but it's, it's so, if you're wondering, it's like, doesn't she know what she's talking about? I was like, yeah, I've been lecturing on this a while, but you, you don't want me to wander off into what my cats were doing today, because it, it could happen. I realize I'm blocking my own. Um, I'll just scoot over a little bit. There we go. All right. So when we talk about the end of the Cold War, one of the things we all have to remember is, you know, we all know what it was, right? We all lived through it. We all have memories of the end of the Cold War. But memory is not history. Um, my dissertation was on the historical memory of Irish neutrality. And historical memory is a fascinating part of history. It's the history of how people remember events. But it's, it's not the same thing as the history of an event. And it's one of the tricky bits of studying recent history, right? It's trying to figure out what's memory and, and what's, what's actually history. And for the end of the Cold War, we haven't really gotten to history yet. We're still looking at, at the memory sort of things. I can tell you my memory of the Reagan presidency that as I've discovered studying the Reagan presidency, that's not the history of the Reagan presidency. That's what I remember about it. And it's not necessarily always the same thing. A complete perspective on the history of the Cold War likely won't emerge until all of us are gone. It takes a long time for historians to sort everything out, get the distance, get the perspective. We can't have distance, right? We remember the Cold War. We're not the generation that's going to be able to take a long look at it. 
some years ago, I was at a conference. Um, God, I think it was the AHA in New Orleans. It was a long time ago. But I happened to be in a room where Cold War historians were declaiming that the Cold War was the defining element of the second half of the 20th century. And as a Cold War historian, I was cheering them on. But there was another group in the room proclaiming that that was the wrong interpretation. That in fact, decolonization and the rise of what at the time we called the third world was actually the defining element of the second half of the 20th century. And it got heated. And I, and I was still a pretty brand new historian. I was not getting into it. But it was interesting to watch. And at that particular conference, maybe a decade ago, the Cold War historians won. But in 200 years, I, I don't know. I mean, I know that sounds insane, right? But in 200 years, the story of the second half of the 20th century, Cold War might be a footnote. The rise of China might be the big story. I don't know. I was talking to my students this morning, um, trying to explain historical periodization, and I don't think they got the joke because they're, you know, 17 years old. But I made the point that they need to remember that historians label things. Nobody in 1630 said, well, thank God we're halfway through the 30 years war. And, and they don't think about that, right? Because of course it's the 30 years war that's going on. It's like, yeah, but not at the time. So we know it's the Cold War. But in 200 years, we, we don't even know what they'll call this. Now, this isn't to like say all of this and then say, well, I'm done. You know, the Cold War doesn't exist. We're out the door. It's just for us to remember that there's there's going to be changing perspectives. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We need to remember that this is a major event. This is the defining element, certainly of my childhood and quite possibly of your childhood as well. But in 200 years, it might be very little at all. Luckily for us, that's not for us to worry about, right? It'll be 200 years from now. We're not gonna know if the Cold War suddenly disappears as a, <coughs> excuse me, um, as a historical moment. For us, the Cold War is still the defining element of the second half of the 20th century. It's still probably, hopefully not just for me, one of the most important events that occurred in my lifetime. And today, hopefully, We'll get through it today. I know how many notes are sitting in front of me. We got to kill it. We got this. We can kill the Cold War in a day. I went ahead and took a look at Dr. Gaddis's book um, since you guys were assigned to read it. And I'm really counting on the fact that all of you have been keeping up with your reading or barring that, remembering your childhoods. Because I'd really like to start this um, in the 1970s. I don't want to retell the story of the earlier bits of the Cold War, um, but we're gonna start really in that period of detente, right? The 60s, the 70s, that halcyon days when they're pretending to talk about things and, and sort things out. And Dr. Gaddis, of course, makes a big point in his book that this is the moment when they start deciding that the Cold War is entrenched and they're just gonna be managing the Cold War from here on out. And that's, that's not a bad interpretation of, of what they mean, right? When we say, well, the Cold War is gonna happen, we just have to figure out how best to make the Cold War work. Um, and, and you know, you can argue, and of course, remember, this is when I want you guys to go back to your, to your childhoods and your teenagerhoods, and I am not judging anybody by their looks in here, but for me, it was my teenagerhood, right? And we can take a look at it and say, you know, okay, I can see the Cold War as something to be endured. As a kid, I certainly didn't think the Cold War was going to disappear. And if the Cold War was going to disappear, I grew up in Seattle and we were a first strike target, and, and I live within sight of an airbase. Trust me, I don't want the Cold War to end because it wasn't assumed it was going to go peacefully. We all thought we were going to glow. We were given the math in school for exactly how long it was going to take for the blast that was going to hit the major Boeing plant in downtown Seattle to get to my suburb. We had three minutes. I tell my students this at, at Ohio University Zanesville, and they're all just like, what? And it's like, Sorry, that was the Cold War. We knew exactly how long we were gonna live after the nuclear bomb hit Seattle. And we were pretty grateful we were in the first strike zone after watching the day after in 1983. I was really grateful that I was gonna be melted. And I'm certain that if some of you guys are in the same sort of boat, um, I make my students watch that movie. It's like a little bit of torture. Hey, let's watch the day after, let's go for it. Um, and then the ones who think that was cool, there's some British ones that make the day after look PG. 
I mean, like really calm. It's like, you like this one? I'm not going to describe the British movies, but wow, they take it to that next level, like anarchy in the streets sort of thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's go back to detente. See, this is why I have notes in front of me. Right there. Day after is nowhere on this page. That's just me wandering off into the underbrush. You must guard against this. When we're talking about detente as kind of this period to be endured, bear in mind, in the 1970s, you guys know this, right? Nobody was thinking about ending the Cold War. Everybody's a little preoccupied at that point. The United States still dealing with Vietnam and trying to get out of Vietnam in the early 1970s. The less said about Watergate, the better. But I mean, th there's, there's no moment in the uh, early to mid 1970s where the United States is like, hey, you know what? We're bored, nothing's going on. Let's have a conversation with the Soviets about ending the Cold War. They're busy. We're, we're kind of busy with internal kerfuffles at this point. And to be fair, the Soviets are really no better, right? 1968, it's the Prague Spring. Um, there's a downfall of Khrushchev in 64, so there's some working out over who's gonna replace Khrushchev. Um, they think the world was going their way in the late 1960s and 1970s. Vietnam goes communist. Um, some of the decolonizing parts of the world start to lean a little lefty. The Soviets are kind of looking like they're on a bit of a tear, but they're preoccupied, right? They're supporting leftist movements all over the world. They don't have time, nor are they really thinking about trying to, even, even after detente, getting into ending the Cold War. And of course, the Arab-Israeli crisis flares up in 67 and 73, and both the Soviets and the Americans get embroiled in that. So we shouldn't be surprised that there's no, nobody talking about, you know, we could end this thing. And, and we all remember, even if they were, we think that means we're all going to blow. So we would prefer that they don't try to end this thing. Managing it was pretty much all they could handle. The great thing about where we are in this story, we're all kind of at least semi-omniscient historians. And this is what's great about being a historian. Living through it, I thought we were all going to die. Now that it, we're a few years behind, we can go back, right? This is, this is historians time traveling. We can go, ah, there's some cracks in the system. So we, at a short remove, can go back and go, okay, that is going to be a crack in the system. That's going to be a crack in the system. Oh, I can see it. It's starting to crumble here. And that's what we can do at this point, right? We can see where, where now that it's over, now that we think it's over, we can now see maybe how it crumbled, right? They couldn't at the time. I don't know if they were incredibly brave. Gorbachev, Reagan, Bush, okay, not Brezhnev, or incredibly stupid. To, to work their way through the end of the Cold War, considering the alternative way it could have ended. They didn't know how it was gonna turn out. We can go back and take a closer look. So we can see the cracks in the system, we can see how it destabilizes, and that's what I'd like to kind of go through a little bit. <sighs> okay. And I promise I will not lose my voice until after. This is just water. The other thing that my students laugh about, it's not moving. I am not a Luddite. In a previous life, I worked for Microsoft. That's not your fault. I forgot to pull up the... Uh... Okay, thank you. It's okay. Um, bearing in mind, um, I worked for Microsoft explaining to people that Windows 95 wasn't as bad as they thought it was <laughs> right after it was introduced. So that tells you how long ago it was. But I, I can't say I love teaching with technology. But I don't know if you've heard about this, you know, um, COVID thing that's been going on. And I've been teaching to a camera for two and a half years now. So whether I like teaching with technology or not, it appears to be the future from, from here on out. All right. So what I want to do is talk about what the Soviet Union looked like before Gorbachev came on the scene. Then I want to talk about um, more or less the international situation before Reagan came on the scene. Then we'll toss those two into the mix. Then, with time's going to stop, and I'm going to have enough time to do all of this, then we're going to kill the Warsaw Pact, 
And then somehow I doubt we're going to kill the Soviet Union tonight, but I can be optimistic. Sure, we can. You've already noticed I talk really, really fast, which tends to be helpful. Except, you know, interestingly enough, my students aren't too fond of how fast I speak. It, it turns out it's a little hard for them to take lecture notes. Serves a mark for not doing the reading. All right. So, as you can see from my slide, um, in the Soviet Union, the people running things before Gorbachev came into, um, into town were collectively known as the Old Guard. And um, there's a reason why they were called the Old Guard, because they were increasingly old. Um, there's an apocryphal story. One of my colleagues down at Athens, um, he's a Sovietologist down there, used to say, and I haven't been able to find any uh, reinforcement of the story that he used to tell us, which is why I call it apocryphal. I don't have evidentiary support for it. But the joke was that in the 1970s, they had to install an escalator at the main viewing stand for the Soviet military parades because the leadership of the Soviet Union could no longer tackle the stairs. Now, I don't know if that's a true story. It's one of those things that might illustrate a truth, whether or not it's actually a true story and they actually had to install an escalator. But Brezhnev was born in 1906 and Dropov was born in 1914 and Chernyenko was born in 1911. So the three guys running things in the 70s and then in the early 1980s were all born before World War I. So ageism is not something I approve of. So the mere fact that they're old doesn't preclude them from running the Soviet Union, right? Age is not necessarily the issue. The problem is that these are all people who were also born before the Soviet Union was a thing. They are all people who invested in the ideology of the system and who profited from the system. These are the people who won in the Soviet Union. These are not the Joe peasants. These are not the people who are having trouble getting food. These are not the people who spent some time in a gulag for saying the wrong thing. These are the guys who are like, oh my God, the system works. Look at me, I'm the premier of the Soviet Union. And so they're, they're older, they're entrenched. One of the words that I have seen used to describe it is moribund, which is, which is not polite, but probably pretty accurate. But across the board, even as it became known that potentially reform is something they might want to do, these are not the guys who are potentially going to be affecting reform. Right? Why should they reform it? The system works just fine for them. Um, and increasingly, in the 1970s and 1980s, people were understanding at some levels that re reform was something that needed to be done. Um, Yuri Andropov, before he was Soviet premier, he was head of the KGB. And if anybody knew what was going on in the Soviet Union, it's the KGB. And so he knew that things were a lot worse than everybody thought. And I mean, think how bad it had to be in the Soviet Union that the KGB was saying, you know, man, we gotta do some reform here. So I mean, but that's the point. He's, he's one guy. He can see that reform is needed, but the, it's such a big scale. And he really doesn't have anybody at the top that's in agreement with him. I mean, reform is gonna be tricky. <laughs> See, we're omniscient, right? We know reform is tricky because look what happened when Gorbachev tried it and, and, and Dropov knew this. So he might have been arguing reform um, and when he comes into power, he's going to try some, but he doesn't have the time to make it happen and he certainly doesn't have the support, right? Everybody else at the top thinks the system is working relatively well. The one thing Andropov did that proved really useful is that he nurtured a younger generation. Gorbachev was one of his protégés. So he was like, well, maybe I can't do all the reform, but maybe I can get people into the Politburo who are younger. Um, Gorbachev got into the Politburo when he was about the same age I am, as I am now. And before you say anything, he was 54 when he got into the Politburo. I saw the looks. Uh, yeah. So in his mid-50s. So that works pretty well. So that's one thing, right? Old guard, deteriorating system, a perceived need for reform, no real anxiety to do the reform. Another aspect for the Soviet Union is the fact that the promise that they had been giving people since the revolution broke out was increasingly seeming hollow, right? Revolution breaks out in 1917. In the 1920s, they're saying, hang in there, tomorrow will be paradise. In the 1930s, they're saying, hang in there, paradise is coming. 
They could argue that World War II took it back a couple of steps, but you know, by the 1970s, people are starting to realize that paradise not, might not be coming. So that hang on a little bit longer isn't really selling it to people. It's been too many generations. There have been too many people. There's a marvelous book whose name escapes me, sorry, but some historians compiled a list of Soviet Union jokes back in the day. And, and I used to read them, have them to my students, but they didn't know what dry cleaning was. So, and, and I can't remember all of the jokes, but there's one about somebody ordering a car and you know, the, the delivery date was, okay, I can do it on like January 15th, 10 years from now. And the guy says, oh, that won't work. Why not? That's the day the plumber is coming. <laughs> The, the fact that jokes like this existed in the Soviet Union illustrates that people are really, it's like, you know, this is not a system that's working. And so it's another thing that the old guard is dealing with, that no matter what they do, right, people are falling away from this. But there's another issue that my students just freak out when I tell them about, that technology is coming into play. And of course, when they hear technology, and when I tell them the technology I'm talking about, this is other stuff they don't know existed. But you know, you guys will all remember this, right? Late 1970s, early 1980s, hot new technology, satellite television, the ability to record TV shows, copiers. And if you're trying to control the message in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, this is really problematic. One of the slogans of the Soviet Union was, you may not have it so good, I am paraphrasing, but it's even worse in the West. People are starving in the streets in the West. And, and we can agree, right? Um, we're in downtown Wheeling. People are starving in the streets of the West. But, but the Soviet message was that everybody is. What are the hot, what were the two most popular American TV shows, nighttime dramas in the 1980s? Ready? Dallas. What's the other one? Horrible evening soap operas? Oh God, that's even worse. Right? Well, that one would, that would, would play into the Soviets, wouldn't it? Dynasty, right? West German TV played Dallas and Dynasty. East Germans picked it up on their satellite dishes, recorded it, and it was like snuck through. Now, mind you, that is no more accurate a portrayal of the West than everybody starving in the streets. But could you imagine the average person going, Oh my God, they all have giant ranches. <laughs> Insane. But, but that's the point. The Soviets couldn't control the message anymore. I know copiers do not seem revolutionary. But back in the day, Samizdat and Tamizdat, information from outside circulating through the Soviet Union, information from the Soviet Union circulating out, used to have to be handwritten. You know, typewriters were hard to get their hands on. Copiers, which were also somewhat controlled, but... I, I, I know I certainly appreciated when copiers came into existence and I may not love computers, but I remember typing papers on a typewriter and I gotta say, I do prefer computers for typing papers. I am not certain I would have become a historian if I'd had to type my dissertation on a typewriter. Uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think my patience would have gotten me through 400 pages of that. But, but it's, it's another way that the Soviets can't control the message. So, you know, the picture I'm trying to give you here is that they're hanging on a knife edge. They're potentially crumbling. There's an awful lot of cracks in the system. Um, and Dr. Gaddis in his book suggests that it's a, what a sand pile, right? The right amount of movement is, is going to send it collapsing. Hold on. Just because they're crumbling from within doesn't mean the rest of the world could see it. Um, when I was living in England, I picked up some CIA estimates books. Um, I, I don't have them anymore because they were really big and I was not paying to ship them back to the States. But in the 1980s, the CIA tried to, you know, estimate how much the Soviets were spending on their defense. And the assumption was that they were spending about the same amount of their GDP as the Americans were um, of our GDP. And it also estimated that the Soviet GDP was about the same, right? Because they don't know. There, there aren't numbers. We know now that a lot of those Soviet military parades had mock-ups in them, so not all of the missiles were actually operating missiles, but the CIA was you know, counting missiles and, and guessing. 
um, outside the Soviet Union, it's kind of opaque. So, I mean, I can say now, it's like, oh my God, they were crumbling. They were so close. But in the 70s and 80s, there, there's really nobody outside going, you know, if we just push them a little bit, they're going to implode. So in, internationally, they still look pretty strong. Um, and so that's what we're going to, so it's, it's a chimera, but they look good. And then I take a deep breath and I drink more water because, oh my God, it's getting a little, we'll be fine. All right, so now let's leave them hanging on their knife edge and kind of swing back around and take a look at the international situation. Um, as you guys know from the reading, detente really hits its high point in the early 1970s. Uh, and when I use the word detente, I'm really talking about three different tracks of detente when we're looking at kind of the international diplomacy situation. The big one, and this is the one that Dr. Gaddis concentrates on, is the detente between the Soviets and the Americans, very important. Um, but it's important for us to remember that one of the reasons why the Soviets and the Americans are talking is because of the second track of detente, which the Americans and the Chinese saying, you know, don't we both kind of hate the Soviets right now? Which is another valuable, you know, tack for detente. I'm not sure the Soviets would have been quite so happy to talk to us if we weren't already talking to China. You know, suddenly it becomes a little freeway. That is not the phraseology that I meant to use, and I apologize <laughs> for using that particular word, but I haven't used a swear word yet. And if my students are watching this, they're gonna be very impressed that I haven't actually used a swear word yet. I've, I've bit a couple off while talking. Um, so the talks between the Americans and the Chinese are another important track because it's kind of a counterbalance to the Americans and the Soviets. There's a third track of detente that's going on that's much more lower level. But in the 1970s, we also have European powers talking to other European powers. These are cultural exchanges. These are smaller economic talks between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. They're not about the end of the Cold War. They're not about arms limitation talks. They're about ballet companies going from place to place. They're a lot lower level, but they're a lot more integrative and much more longer lasting. But I mean, it's, it's another level when we're talking about detente. There's an awful lot of conversations going on that are all gonna feed into the end of the Cold War somewhat. But as you guys know, detente has that high point and, and then it slows. Um, and for, for lots of reasons, you know, um, Vietnam is going, you know, the, the uh, agreement when the Americans get out of Vietnam is starting to unravel and, and Vietnam goes fully communist by 1975. Um, the civil war in Angola is getting huffy um, in the mid 1970s. We've got the Ethiopian and Somalia war going on. So, you know, this isn't necessarily flaring up in Cold War tensions, but we are going to see an increase in the proxy wars of the Cold War. And I know that um, it was Dr. Gorby, right, who talked about the global Cold War. I'm talking about the various proxy wars. So that's that's going to be a thing, um, certainly, as well. But before detente fades away completely, there's this last gasp. Um, it's the it's a big meeting of the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, CSCE. You guys would know it as Helsinki. And that's the big meeting in 1975. Um, the Helsinki Final Act is both a glorious moment of detente and the end of detente. The Helsinki Final Act created a massive agreement that everybody wanted to sign for completely different reasons. So in the Helsinki Final Act, they, um, they put all of these various agreements into various baskets. So baskets one and two are, are super traditional sort of things. You know, if, if you look at international agreements, there's, there's like this standard sort of, what are we tossing into the mix? Um, the Soviets really liked baskets one and two because one of the agreements was agreeing on the post-World War II borders. And the Soviets are like, finally, we, we've got an agreement on the post-World War II frontiers. Um, baskets one and two said, we're going to share military operation. Uh, mil sorry, that is not the word I meant. Um, military information. And take that for what you will, right? What does it mean to share military information? How much? Who gets to decide? Doesn't matter. It looks good on paper. They're signing it. Um, there's also a line in the first couple of baskets about promising um, economic, scientific, and technological cooperation. More of it. Okay, that sounds good. 
Everybody's signing on. And the Soviets really liked that frontiers thing. Basket three was the human rights basket. You guys remember this from the Gaddis book. They pledged themselves to allow closer contacts between peoples and greater respect for human rights. The Soviets weren't the only ones who were like, you know, we do stuff in parts of the world where that might not suggest that we have a close relationship to human rights, but we'll sign it anyway. The Soviets had no idea what they were potentially opening up by signing that, right? Um, everyone wanted the signing of the Accords. Um, the human rights clauses gave them a little bit of pause. Um, and for the Soviet Union, these clauses, those human rights clauses, provided a mechanism for criticism of Soviet rule. They signed on to it. They said, we're going to have greater openness for human rights, um, greater respect for human rights, right there on paper. And as dissidents gain in size and number and prominence, technology making it more possible for them to get the word out, citizens of Warsaw Pact countries, citizens of the Soviet Union are going to use the Helsinki Final Act to, to, to put no fine point on it, to paint the Soviets into a corner somewhere, right? You sign greater respect for human rights. <clears throat> um, Soviets ended up with very little room to maneuver because they'd signed on to this particular deal. Guess what? This is why I'm not supposed to try to use slides when I'm teaching. We just finished talking about that. Oopsie. Okay. We got this. But look how much time we just spent on that slide. But that was a, ooh, a photograph of the Helsinki signing. All right. So all of this is the knife edge of the late 1970s. Now, from the Soviet standpoint, this was not supposed to be the start of the intensification of the Cold War. The 1979 Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, from their perspective, right, um, we got to go back in time a little bit. 68, they send tanks into Prague. Nobody says boo when they put tanks into Prague. To be, to be fair, 1968, America was completely preoccupied. We were way too busy to get huffy about Czechoslovakia. But in the aftermath of the Prague Spring, Brezhnev proclaimed the Brezhnev Doctrine, right? Brezhnev Doctrine, no retreat from socialism. We're drawing a line. We are, these are the socialist states. We are gonna prop up our socialist states. Communism is irreversible. This is what we're gonna do. This is why we went into Prague. Communism is a thing. Um, it's a warning to all their satellites. It's, a, it's an announcement to the world. <laughs> From their perspective, the invasion of Afghanistan was upholding the Brezhnev Doctrine. There had been a Soviet-friendly, puppet-esque government in Afghanistan in the 1970s. It was one of their security interests. I mean, Come on, R Russia's had a thing for Afghanistan since the 19th century. Don't know why, but they have, right? It's next door, something they've been in invested in. Um, they've managed to set up a friendly government. And of course, their friendly government had gotten replaced by another communist, but muddled government. And of course, Dr. Gaddis plays up the fear in the Soviet Union that perhaps this new government might have leaned towards the Americans. I I'm not not convinced they would leap to the Americans, but the uncertainty was there. The Soviets are like, well, we've got the Brezhnev Doctrine. This is one of our security interests. This is a place where we have a puppet government. We're gonna go in, it's only gonna take a few months. We're gonna go in, we're gonna reinstall guys we like. We got this, easy peasy. No one's gonna say a thing. To be fair to the Soviets, think about it. Prague Spring, Poland, 1956, Hungary, 1956, Berlin Wall, 1961. Is anyone going to say boo to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan? Well, turns out may, may, maybe a little at this particular moment. Um, of course, problem number one for the Soviets, not everybody knew the invasion was going to happen. Political invasion versus military invasion. The politicians were in charge. I will not say anything more than that sentence. You guys can fill in 
politicians arranging an invasion might not be the best path going forward. Problem number two, turns out the Afghans were a little harder to invade and conquer than the Soviets expected, so they get bogged down. Problem number three, the American government took it upon themselves to take the opportunity to make a strong stance. It's a lot of reasons why the Americans are gonna take a strong stance. The fact that President Carter desperately needed a foreign policy victory, probably a pretty big one. Um, not a shining example of foreign policy successes for President Carter in 1978. 1979, you guys know where I'm going with this, right? I can't be the only one who had an American flag with a little yellow ribbon on it outside of my house for 444 days, right? And the fact that I can still rattle that off illustrates how important that particular moment is. <clears throat> they had to make a strong stance. President Carter re-intensified the Cold War. He made a much stronger response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan than certainly the Soviets expected. The Senate delayed the ratification of, of SALT II, so that last bit of um, detente, dead in the water. Carter embargoed grain shipments to the Soviet Union. My students laugh when I talk about them boycotting the 1980 games, and it was like, look, it's not symbolic. When the Americans don't go to the Moscow games, loads of other people don't go to the Moscow games. This was financially detrimental to the Soviet Union to have that boycott. And it hurt them way worse than their, ooh, we're going to boy boycott Los Angeles in 84. Um, so, I mean, it was a big deal, even if it doesn't feel quite as much of a big deal as vastly increasing military spending. And I know it's weird when I say Carter started it. I know. But, but he certainly set us on this particular path. The Cold War was heating up before Reagan got elected. But of course, it didn't stop when Reagan got elected. I don't know what it would have been um, if Carter had gotten reelected. As a sci-fi fan, I'm fascinated by counterfactuals. As a historian, I am forbidden from doing counterfactuals. All historians do it. We all do the, huh, I wonder what if, but, but officially, no, 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 no. Counterfactuals don't exist for historians. I don't know. I mean, I don't think the Cold War would have calmed down. Carter was really upset about the human rights thing. So I think he would have continued it as well, but Carter wasn't Reagan. And, and Reagan brought that presence. We all remember it. Reagan brought the presence. He brought the, the gravitas, the fact that he was an actor. And when he came on the scene, he intensified the Cold War pretty strongly. He actually started sending them green again we produced a lot of grain. Selling it to the Soviets was, was good business sense. You know, so we're gonna feed him, but he's really gonna up the rhetoric against the Soviets when he comes into power, and he's really gonna up the military spending. And that's gonna be a much more visible shift than what Carter had done um, as well. <clears throat> Sometimes I wonder why I have the notes in front of me if I'm not even going to look at them. Um, Salt II was already pretty much dead in the water, but Reagan made a visible um, commitment to not trying to engage much in the way of any sort of additional arms limitation talks. I know he gets into the START treaty talks later, but, but that was largely seen as symbolic. You know, the point was, no, we're not talking to them. We are doing, you know, if anything, pressuring them. Um, if we look at, you know, okay, so up the military spending, up the rhetoric, this is the evil empire years. Um, Deploying Pershing twos in, in Europe, that's not a warm and fuzzy sort of thing to do. Um, stepped up interventions uh, against lefty leaning governments in Central America. We hopefully all remember the invasion of Grenada in 1983, that sort of thing. I mean, but all of it, I, mean, I know a lot of it looks like posturing, but it's all, excuse me, very visible, you know, don't you even try anything, Soviet Union, we've got your number and it's going to work. You know, it's, it's, for my money, it was risky at the time. We're omniscient. We know it turned out okay. You know, we know it was all right. But in 1983, 
I don't think anybody in 1983 was going, oh, well, thank God they're destabilizing the Cold War. I'm sure this will turn out well. I mean, it was really scary um, in 1983. Much of that has to do with, with Reagan's actions on board. Um, brave, brave of him to destabilize the Cold War in this way. Of course, what's the big thing that he does symbolically? There we go. Strategic Defense Initiative. You know, I think we're we're still funding that. Probably. Out your the last time I checked it out on Wikipedia, I don't know how many trillions we've spent on that. Don't have it perfected quite yet. I'm sure we will. Just give us a little bit more time, right? Um, but SDI was a big deal. There's a lot of apocryphal stories about the creation of SDI. Um, someone said. This, this has got to be wrong. Someone suggested that he had watched some sci-fi thing and thought it was real. I don't think that one's true. Yeah. But um, what I've heard from more than one historian is that he'd heard scientists talking about something along the lines of, wouldn't it be cool if? And he kind of took that and ran with it and went, well, may maybe we should try to make the if a reality. But at the time he's suggesting it, it is a gleam in someone's eye. I mean, I had a computer in 1983. It was a Commodore 64 that we plugged into the TV. So I'm reasonably certain uh, incredibly accurate ballistic missile defense was probably not in our wheelhouse at that point. But it doesn't matter that it wasn't going to work. It matters that there's no way the Soviets could have made one. It matters that it was an incredibly expensive system. It also matters that it possibly broke that bit of the SALT treaty that says you're not supposed to create anti-ballistic missile systems, which made it a little controversial. That's certainly one of the ways the Soviets got mad at it. It's like, okay, you're not supposed to do this. Like, yeah, it's going to cost us too much money. Don't make us try to do it. But, but that, I mean, I know it sounds insane, right? It's a system that doesn't work to this day. But, but that was an outsized sort of problem for the Soviets. You'd kind of think that the really accurate, fast, and lots of Pershing twos would actually be a bigger problem, but that was a known problem. SDI, SDI could have changed everything. And so, and Reagan went all in on it in a way that um, I'm not sure another president necessarily would have at the time. All right. When Reagan comes into power, the guy running the Soviet Union is still old guard, right? It's Brezhnev. Um, Brezhnev was not healthy wasn't young. Not saying that being older automatically means you're unhealthy, but Brezhnev was not terribly healthy. When Brezhnev croaked, the guy who replaces him is Andropov. Andropov means to be a reformer. Andropov is dying of kidney disease during his entire tenure. When he died, before he died, he left instructions over who he wanted his replacement to be. He wanted Mikhail Gorbachev. But someone arranged for that not really to be known because the old guard didn't want Gorby. The old guard wanted the old guard, which is how we got Konstantin Chernyenko, who was not in the hospital the entire time he was premier, um, but he was uh, sick with emphysema. And he made it what? Was it 13 months? I think he made it in power. And of course, the negotiation was Chernyenko will be premier and Gorby will be deputy premier. But in 83, 84, I mean, there's this quip that Reagan makes, right? I want to talk to the Soviets, but they keep dying on me. Which, come to think of it, isn't the most politic thing he could have said. Um, but, I mean, that's the point, right? Um, it's the old guard. And it's the old guard, certainly not being in a position where they're going to necessarily um, talk to Reagan. And, and Reagan could quip like that, right? It's a perfect moment for Reagan. He can say he wants to talk to the Soviets without really ever having to do much talking to the Soviets. So he can go, well, I'm willing to talk, but they, they're not around. But it means that when Gorby comes into play, you know, Reagan's going to have to put his money where his mouth is because now there's somebody who's going to be willing to talk. All right. One of the things I love about Dr. Gaddis um, is that he took a very Americanist approach in his book. And um, technically, I have a PhD field in American history. Um, you know, 30 years ago, they make you do four fields. And since I got my graduate degree overseas, 
I did not get the memo that you could have overlapping PhD fields. So I have colleagues who like got a field in American political history and a field in American social history and a field in American foreign relations. Their exams were easy peasy, right? Because it all overlapped each other. And so I just kind of went, oh, well, I guess they have to be different fields. Um, so my fields are uh, modern Europe, Soviet Union, Middle East, and Soviet Union, uh, sorry, US foreign relations. Not a pleasant exam situation. Um, so when I was rereading Gaddis for this, it was like, well, thank God I don't have to talk about the Americans. <clears throat> you got this. And besides, um, did you guys not all live through the 1970s and 1980s by and large? Yeah, you know the American history. I was uh, lecturing on the American Revolution this morning, and I tried, and I'm really hoping my students found this funny, about how we weren't going to do an order of battle history on the American Revolution because I was reasonably certain they all knew who won. And, and even as I said that, it was like, God, I hope that you guys all know who <laughs> I don't want to assume, but I'm kind of hoping that that's the case. So by the same token, from here on out, we're taking a more of a Europeanist approach. We're going to talk about Gorby. <gasps> Thank you. Oh, my. I'm not going to say any swear words. I really want to, though. Okay. Oopsie. All right. Gorbachev comes into power trying to fix the problems of the Soviet Union. He knows that reform is needed. Like his mentor Gorbachev, what he wants is moderate reform. And so in 85, 86, when he's first in power, that's what he's trying to do. There is the first wave of reform is something they call the law and order campaign. The catchphrase for it is Uskarenya. The reason why you guys are saying, wait, I've never heard of that, is because, oh my God, it was not successful. You can see why. They start with an anti-alcohol campaign. They cut down vineyards. They tripled the price of vodka. The point was, everybody, get back to work. What is this with absenteeism? Come on, and drop off was KGB. Of course, he's going to start with a law and order campaign. But this is small-scale reform. It's like, well, if we can get everybody back to their jobs and working, we can turn this ship of the Soviet Union around. It doesn't work terribly well. He tries to do the law and order campaign, and he gets some of the younger reformers into office. He appoints people to the Politburo, like Edward Shevardnadze, who's going to become his foreign minister, and, and I'm certain he regretted this later, Boris Yeltsin, who seemed like a young, engaging reformer on some level. This is what he's doing in 85 and 86. And yes, I am speeding it up and not giving you fun stories because now I know what time it is. Good. What, what does going over it mean? Okay. All right. And this, this is when I say, you guys know I live in Zanesville, right? I got to drive, but that's all right. That's all right. All right. Um, he's trying to reform internally. At Chernyanko's funeral, he makes the really strong suggestion to the other Eastern European leaders that they too might want to reform internally. He's arguing that we can fix the system from within. And near as we can tell, and I've read some of his memoirs, he really did think they could fix the system from within. He believed in the system. He had been at university during Khrushchev's thaw. He had been part of that moment when there was just a tiny little bit of openness in the Soviet Union. He benefited from the system. He, you know, in his mind, he's probably thinking, and no, I know it's not appropriate for historians to imagine what other people are thinking, but it seems like he was thinking that they could maybe get back to something like the period of Khrushchev's thaw. <coughs> he told them, you can go your own way. We won't send in the tanks. And understandably, the leaders of the Eastern European country was not necessarily going to take his word for it. Um, so they, they weren't leaping to reform, and, and they were more old guard than that as well. Um, Gorbachev wants to not have to spend so much in the Cold War. Gorbachev wants to get out of the war of Afghanistan. He wants to undertake moderate reform. What puts paid to his moderate reform? What happens in the Soviet Union? 
No fans of Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country? Which is a metaphor to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Come on, Star Trek's always been political, whether we like it or not. Chernobyl. The, the explosion at Chernobyl put paid to, we're going to do slow and steady reform. When Chernobyl exploded, the Soviet leadership tried to keep it secret which lasted right about in time the uh, radioactive clouds hit Scandinavia. <laughs> you can keep it secret, you can't prevent the radiation from going all across Europe. And once the radiation spread beyond the bounds of the Soviet Union, they're, they're stuck. I mean, he's got to step up the rhetoric, he's got to step up the reform. The, the old school Soviet way of doing things isn't going to work anymore. And I know it's insane, right? You're like, what would, what would Chernobyl do? But remember, they can't control the message. Chernobyl went around the world. I can't be the only one in this room who watched the incredibly disturbing and detailed TV series recently on it. I don't think I needed a graphic recreation of Chernobyl, but it was a really good TV show um, all the same. In the wake of Chernobyl, people in the Soviet Union started calling for more transparency, especially when the investigation made it really obvious years of... Um, <laughs> excuse me, incompetence and neglect. And so this is when you start hearing about Glasnost and Perestroika. So many fun stories you're not getting. Sniff. All right. Um, Glasnost means openness. Gorbachev instituted a series of public debates um, suggesting um, an opportunity to widen the conversation regarding reform in the Soviet Union. <clears throat> Openness may have been what it was called. Um, it wasn't true freedom of expression, right? You couldn't necessarily just say anything. Um, Gorbachev and his ilk were deciding the limits of the debate. So I don't want you to think that, you know, suddenly it's, um, you know, the British guys on the street corner on the soapbox saying whatever crazy thing comes to mind. Um, it was still constrained somewhat. So from our perspective, it wasn't full out freedom of expression. But from the Soviet perspective, it was like, well, hey, this is a lot more openness than we previously had had. Um, one of the reasons we think that Gorbachev promoted this greater openness is because he was a true believer in the communist system, right? So he's thinking, we're going to have a marvelous dialogue, and at the end of the day, we're going to win. Which was a, it's an optimistic view, don't you think? Kind of naive, but you know, there we go. That's what he's thinking. We can have the debate because we're going to win um, at, the, out, um, at, at the end of it. And this is a key moment because he's allowing the debate. And it's really impossible to overstate that. It's going to be another key moment later when he doesn't send in the tanks. And, and previous leaders, I'm not certain they would have made the same decision. I mean, Khrushchev promoted openness. Khrushchev did not keep his job. Although, to be fair, Khrushchev was the only Soviet premier who actually got to retire. So, so that's nice in, in a way, if you can call house arrest retirement. But you can. It's a nice dacha. You know, he, he wasn't in a prison cell somewhere. Um, but this is that moment, right? We can start talking about it. Um, Perestroika is, is the economic restructuring, um, trying to do kind of capitalism light. Gorbachev can show Soviet historical precedent for both of these things. He can go back to the thaw for openness. He can go back all the way to the new economic policy of the 1920s, Lenin did some proto-capitalism right at the start of the Soviet Union. So he can say, this is part of the Soviet tradition. He can argue, this is going to fix the Soviet Union. He can probably even believe this is going to fix the Soviet Union. It's also important at this moment that as he's undertaking reform, he can argue to the other Eastern European countries, this is what we're doing you guys should probably affect reform as well. Now, in the Eastern European countries, all the problems in the Soviet Union are also problems in the Eastern European countries. They're dealing with economic stagnation. They're dealing with political corruption. They've got an old guard at the top who are fully invested in the system. The leaders of the Eastern European countries were not popularly elected by their people. They were put in power by the Soviets. Eric Honecker does not want open elections in East Germany. 
He's not an idiot. He knows how that's going to go for him. So when Gorbachev says, we're doing reform, you should do reform, he's not getting a lot of, you betcha, we'll get right on that, sir. They're, they're getting a, we're, we're not listening, we're not going to do this. But that doesn't mean reform isn't happening, right? It's just not happening at the top. The reform is going to be grassroots reform. And this is something when we talk about, you know, like the cracks in the system, the cracks in the Eastern European system also predate the 1980s and the end of the Cold War. We all remember this too. When the Soviet Union extended their control over Eastern Europe, each of the countries essentially got a different deal from the Soviet Union. It's, it's not a monolith, right? Their control in East Germany is a little bit different than their control in Poland, than their control in Czechoslovakia. I, I don't want to make it sound like it's completely negotiated agreements because that implies way too much agency on the part of the Eastern European countries. But everybody got a deal. Poland, for example, got a really good deal out of their 1956 revolution. They got to keep the Catholic Church, for example. Um, they got a little bit more autonomy. They had a little bit more openness in Poland, right? Their people could travel a little bit more than say, I don't know, East Germans could travel. They were a little bit more constrained. So Poland got a little different of a deal. Poland's gonna be our poster child for people working things out in Eastern Europe. Because Poland got a better deal in 56 and Poland erupts in 1970. And as you guys know, Poland erupts again in the late 1970s. This is incredibly problematic for the Soviet Union because who's rising in revolt in Poland? Working class. There we go. That's a that's tricky, isn't it? Vanguard of the proletariat. Vanguard of the proletariat. You know, when it's the Prague Spring and it's those college students, you know, be getting a little mouthy. You know, you can say it's those pesky intellectuals, but oh my God, when it's literally shipyard workers. Really hard to spin that one, you know, um, especially when it's shipyard workers who want their own union. It's like, how, how do you say that this is not the heart of what the solidarity of the workers are all about? Um, in 1970, um, they paper it over, they imprison some people, they kind of get some deals. In the late 1970s, this is a moment where there's this shining moment of reform. For about a year, solidarity exists. People are happy. There's some opening up the Catholic Church broadcast services on Polish TV. Think about the technology, the openness. This was amazing. And then a rumor got spread that the Soviets were going to send in tanks. Hey, in 1981, it's still Brezhnev. It could have happened, right? He just invaded Afghanistan after all. We don't know. Brezhnev doctrine is still in play. And so, of course, the Polish government says, you know, maybe, maybe we should do martial law. You know, let's, let's not risk Soviet tanks. And I know it sounds insane that they undertook martial law potentially to avoid a worse fate, but that was part of the argument at the time. Martial law kills, look at that constrains, solidarity, imprisoned, not killed. See, signs of progress all over the place um, in order to prevent Soviet tanks. But when we talk about cracks in the system, that's why Poland's our, our poster child. We can use Hungary, right, 56. Um, we can use Hungary in the 1980s, having that big funeral for Emre Nagy. That's a big moment, bringing him back onto the state. Um, onto the stage. I was going to say table, and then I was going to say stage, and I came this close to saying stable. Because that's where we are um, in the evening somewhat. I am there. Excellent. All right. I know you say that you guys have gone over, and I really wanted to get all the way to 91. <laughs> that was all on Poland. We're good. Oh, we can do it. I'll just talk faster. <laughs> Kidding. Poland is the tip of the iceberg. And you guys know this. Throughout the 1980s, several Eastern European countries are faced with grassroots efforts from below, some attempt at reformers in the system. Those other Gorbys out there, they're not running the countries. 
But there's other Gorbis out there. There's other reformers and other communist party systems who want the openness, who would like to stay in power in a more open communist system. Um, it's going to start really in Poland. I mean, in 1987, Poland really seriously starts opening up. Um, they have a popular referendum to approve economic reforms. That's kind of a big deal. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the, the government promote, promoted economic reforms in 1987. Popular referendum vote. The people didn't like it. The government tried to impose them anyway. Protest strikes break out. I mean, that's the point, right? The legitimacy of the governments is no longer in the hands of the governments. The Soviets will no longer prop up the governments. The legitimacy is shifting to the people. We see that in Poland throughout the 1980s. In Poland, we see pluralism. In 1989, we see nearly bloodless revolutions across much of, of Eastern Europe. Now, I'm going to throw it back at you guys because we're kind of finishing up for tonight. Come on. I'm looking at this room. I'm making complete judgments based on what I'm seeing. But I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that most of you were alive in 1989. What did you guys think? I, I mean, was this a great moment of hope? Were you waiting for the tanks? before there were tanks. I, I mean, now we can look at it a great period of hope. I, I, in 1989, I was, in, I was working in Germany. I was working for American University in Munich. Okay? So we had a tour that went to Czechoslovakia. I was in, I was in Prague when Václav Havel made his speech there in Excellent. downtown Prague. I was an American visiting there at the time. Wow. And, and I wasn't waiting for the tanks to come in. I, you know, it didn't, you know, if you move, I've been, I've got to travel to, to some of these, these small countries, check them out. I went to, I went to visit the DDR. Okay. And, and the whole thing about it is their system, even, you know, even though they were promising a lot, it didn't work. The whole thing about if, if I wanted to buy if I wanted to buy a car and I lived in the DDR, which was the best of the Eastern Bloc countries, probably. Um, if I had if I had some pool with the, with the with the party and I wanted to wait uh, ten years, I could get myself a trolley. I know a little two-cylinder, two-stroke engine, crappy car with I'm the crew dog in, 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 in West Berlin to drive a Mercedes and BMW. It didn't work. Right. And, and, and well, that's that's what happened. That's you know, the people, the people in those countries that eventually said, so to, and then Border Chop was wise enough to say, you know, this maybe that's not maybe that's not the truth that the way I felt about it. maybe Border Chop said, hey, this doesn't work. Right. I mean, when we when we talk about like really pivotal moments. When Eastern Europe starts to go and, you know, the Eastern European leaders are going back to Gorbachev saying, hello, we're in the Warsaw Pact. You're supposed to be supporting us. And Gorbachev's like, not sending in the tanks, dude. You know, it's your mess. You clean it up. That, that was powerful. It did not do good things for Gorbachev back home to do that. But th that was a moment, right? First Soviet leader to go, oh, look, one of my Eastern European client states is imploding. And I think I'll just watch it happen. I, I mean, I, I don't know how many Soviet leaders, I'm thinking back, you, know, you think about all the Soviet leaders who were before uh, Gorbachev, and it's like, okay, no, now Stalin, no, nope, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't have just let that happen. Um, I mean, but that, that was a brave moment, right? Because he didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know how far it was going to go. But, but you're, um, that, that's an amazing experience that you had, to, to be able to see it on the ground. I, I was a little nervous. Um, when, when it was all going on. I, I was like you, right? It's like, this, this feels too good to be true. Um, when, I, when I was a grad student down in Athens, um, one of the people that I had, um, that I was at school with had been one of the student protesters in Leipzig. And the tales that she had of how exciting it was and how scared they were 
doing the student protests in Leipzig because they didn't know what the future was necessarily going to hold going forward. How are we doing on the live stream? Okay, I'll just, okay, I'll just check him. Oh, excellent. I don't know how many. Um, well, that's cool. The more the merrier on some level. Don't tell me how many there were when we started. That probably won't be any good for my ego at this point. Um, all right, so how about this? Since it's 810, um, next week we'll kill the Soviet Union. We'll, we'll kind of jump ahead a bit. Um, if you want, we can talk a little bit about the fall of the Berlin Wall. If, if you want, we could all do a rousing chorus of whatever the heck it was David Hasselhoff was singing on the top of the Berlin Wall, but probably the less said about that, the better on some level. Um, and, then, and then we'll kind of look at the, the aftermath of it, right? Um, and, you know, when I started this saying, you know, we're not talking about history right now, we're talking about memory and we're talking about the contemporary world, you guys know that goes doubly true, right? I don't know what's going to happen in the next week. I, make a, I have a really strong um, statement in my classes at Ohio University that we do not talk modern politics in my classroom because this is a freaking history class. To be fair, I'm often teaching like, you know, ancient world history. So, of course, we don't talk modern politics. I, I know the talks broke down today. So I, I don't know what we're going to be talking about next week. Well, it won't be American politics, though, right? We'll, we'll be talking about whether or not. I mean, um, my students were asking, you know, like, are, the, are the Russians, I almost said Soviets, are the Russians going to go into Ukraine? And it was like, I, I don't know. I, I don't think so. But I didn't think they'd invade the Crimea. So I, I don't know, man. Are they going to invade Kazakhstan? Of, of course we should. It's it's a ston. By the way, and this is this is an aside. But am I the only person who just tends to say former Soviet Union for that whole? I say former Yugoslavia a lot too, because you know what? There's a lot, and former Soviet Union is a really handy umbrella term that we all know what we're talking about. I don't need to name every single republic that emerged out of there, right? Certainly not. Um, but so, so we'll kind of, and who knows what we'll end up talking about next week, right? It could be, it could be Ukraine. Um, by the way, this is an aside, and Dr. Gatta should hopefully appreciate me saying this. I don't know if you guys watched it back in the 90s, but um, in the mid-1990s, Dr. Gattis was involved in a documentary series on CNN called Cold War, The Cold War. It might still be available on Amazon. It is fascinating. Um, if you remember that old documentary on World War II where they interviewed everybody involved in World War II, this is the same thing with the Cold War. The Cuban Missile Crisis episode is hilarious because Fidel Castro has kittens, metaphorically speaking, over the fact he wasn't a consultant. And he's still really upset about it in the mid-1990s. And so, you know, they're interviewing him, and he's just, like, going off on the interviewers. My students really enjoy that. But it's, it's like, 24 episodes. And, I, I mean, it is really cool. It's, it's talking to George Kennan. It's talking to Clark Clifford. Um, it's, it's talking to Gorbachev. So, I mean, if, if you're thinking after this series, you really want to do a deep dive into, into something else, that CNN series is really good. And this is when we go to questions, right? Oh my God, I'm so sorry, I'm keeping you guys. Anybody has anything they want to add? Questions, comments? Yes. If you found the data that were Western Europe, did the Soviet Union actually have no plans for invading Western Europe? That's where our bodies No, but they were really, really worried about us invading them. Yeah, they had defensive plans. Did they have defensive plans? Did they have defensive plans? Not not that I'm aware of. I mean, I mean, bear in mind, remember, Soviet Union, see, I almost said the word I wasn't going to, has a great deal of territory. So, you know, they don't have to have an offensive plan, right? I mean, what has been their plan every time they've been invaded? They just start backing up. I mean, Napoleon, World War I, World War II, I mean, it's a tradition at this point. So I, I don't know that they would have kept going. I mean, the only evidence that we have, right, is that, again, it's not apocryphal, right? But it's um, somebody congratulating Stalin on getting to Berlin first, and he said, ah, but Alexander made it to Paris. 
<laughs> I mean, it's a quip. And, and under no circumstances did it mean that Stalin was going to continue to Paris, but come on, in 1945, everyone's kind of like edging away from Stalin going, did you mean that? Really? Seriously? But no, I, I don't think they did have offensive plans. But Stalin was kind of paranoid. And, and, and Stalin had the world's largest standing army. You know, I, I can see them getting nervous. Um, I don't necessarily not understand them getting nervous that NATO keeps growing. You know, NATO is not as small as it used to be. You know, NATO is a little bigger. NATO keeps edging up closer to the to the former Soviet Union. We did once sign an agreement saying we would never make it bigger. We did sign that agreement with a country that doesn't exist anymore. So technically, we're not breaking that agreement by expanding NATO. It is causing some kerfuffles, however. And I'm still not exactly sure what NATO's doing these days. Yeah. It's like we can create a loss of group for the green that have to hold the vaccine that we're only for some time. I don't have an answer for that because in my head, I went to the original Red Dawn movie. <laughs> I, I'm a child of the 80s, and I'm thinking, well, you know, we probably wouldn't because, you know, they're just going to parachute in and take over Colorado. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's another counterfactual, you know. Um, the difference is, of course, right, we have moats. I mean, our, our position as United States of America is nearly unique. We can see everybody coming, which is why Red Dawn was so scary in the 1980s, because it's like, OK, that's how somebody gets in, right? They come in from the south. Notice how nobody's worried about Canada. But that's another way they could go. But we've got the Atlantic. We've got the Pacific. R Russia doesn't have the Atlantic and the Pacific. I still am not necessarily comfortable with the place, but I do recognize that their security concerns are not the same as our security concerns. They don't have our modes. You have a lot of frozen water, though. OK. Mm -hmm. it's now. Yeah. You know, um, another, I saw a news story some time ago, uh, reports of a Soviet submarine planting flags um, on the bottom of the Atlantic, of the Arctic, just in case. I mean, that, that's where the next war is going to be, right? Canada versus America versus Russia. Did I say Soviet Union? Oh my God, I've got to stop that. Um, I think Denmark's involved. You know, everybody who's got land on the North Atlantic is like, you know, when this puppy thaws, it's ours. And that'll be a really interesting um, debate to have. You know, notice how Greenland is suddenly getting popular again. I, I wouldn't have thought Greenland would be a place people would want. But, you know, if it melts, I, th I think there's oil there. So that could be really handy on some level. All right. Um, if uh, We're still live streaming, yes? Are we live streaming? Are we done? I think this be a good See everybody next week. Right. Thank you. <laughs>